Welcome to the 17th episode of Tokenizing Everything, our weekly interview series with thought leaders in the blockchain industry. Today's guest is Dan Lebo, financial markets tech pre-academic, 50% practitioner, 50% academic, lecturer at the Rotterdam School of Management and founding director of Lightbulb Capital. Before we begin, I have to mention that all opinions today are solely personal and do not reflect the opinion of Amazing Blocks or any other involved parties. So Dan, nice to have you here today. How are you? Oh, um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to um, join somebody from Germany, which is very refreshing. I've been away from Germany for so long, so it's always good to kind of connect back. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now in this uh, digital age that you enter, it's it's uh, you know a perfect match to kind of stay interconnected, right? So would you maybe start just by briefly introducing yourself, giving an overview of, of your career, who you are, and potentially also how you 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 know came into contact with blockchain sure so um i'm a little bit older so it, it could take a while but i'll try to compress it so that we i don't bore anyone um my first job was in a company back in frankfurt actually a company called rts that built electronic trading systems for equities and futures and options so it's always very close to the sort of secondary market type of activity. When I started, the big innovation was the move from the traditional pit to the computer. So um, I stayed in that sort of part of the finance industry for about 15 years, uh, worked for different banks in, um, in Frankfurt, in London, in Tokyo, in Hong Kong, and then also in Singapore. And then in 2016, I thought, okay, maybe it's time to do something new. I, I started my company, Lightbulb Capital, um, really with the objective to bring innovation or support innovation type activities to the financial markets businesses of this world. And um, in 2016, I met a, a, a professor in one of the schools that I'm teaching at here in Singapore, Singapore Management University. And he told me about this whole blockchain and ICO phenomenon. And I thought, wow, that is real innovation. You know, in banks, you don't really get much innovation. So since then, I've been pretty hooked and very interested. And now I'm, I'm researching blockchain and, and different types of tokens. And um, we also have uh, within Light by Pebble some advisory mandates with the larger financial institutions to help them how to adopt blockchain technology and everything with a financial markets innovation sort of a lens on, I suppose. So yeah, that's kind of 20 years in under two minutes, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I guess that, that already gave a, a good overview, right? Um, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with this coming, you know, from the traditional sector and then kind of discovering blockchain and you know, the disruption this technology inherits and then going all in basically on this space, mm. right? So would you define, you know, obviously you mentioned that you, you this, this friend of yours or, or professor, you know, introduced you to this technology. Was there like a, a special wow moment, like a project or, or a certain aspect of blockchain that really made you realize, okay, I want to, you know, really fully dive into this technology and what it, what it you know, comes with it? I mean, I guess the one thing I would say is we never finish learning. So even though you understand a little bit about Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, the next three things are already on the horizon. So, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, fact that this industry develops so swiftly. Um, I thought that was quite attractive because um, I have a bit of a, also an academic background in the topic of innovation and how new things come about. So um, that is something that I found very attractive. Um, I also thought for a long time about, you know, the fact that the man on the street doesn't really have opportunity for very attractive returns because they're excluded from basically pretty much every other product that can generate that from them. So now we have a market in these new tokens where all of these things are possible, right? And, and people who um, do the homework and try to learn um can make bets that eventually work out quite well for them which is great uh, the one question or the one ask i would have for those people is not to just stop right because we kind of need everyone to investigate more learn more 
drive innovation forward. I think that's quite important. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's also the key, right? Like also just educating yourself and then just continuing to learn about this because even though I, I think, I'm sure you know this, right? Even though we've been in this space for a couple of years, there's still so many new aspects every day almost that, that we learn. So it's, it's very fastly changing and developing. So, you know, before we dive into, right, uh, like capital and tokenization, just a quick question, also out of curiosity, you define yourself as a pre-academic. So um, first of all, how is life as a pre-academic? And uh, secondly, you know, what is currently your core focus on? Mm. Yeah, I get, I get that question a lot. So pre-academic, academic and practitioner kind of in one person, right, merged. Um, I like to think that maybe one thing that I can hopefully bring to the table is that I have seen a practitioner's life uh, in traditional finance. Um, and then I also dove into the whole blockchain topic. Uh, at the moment is actually very much academic. I'm trying to do a lot of research. So perhaps I get a little bit of both worlds and um, I try to differentiate what we do with, you know, being able to leverage my experience in traditional finance, but then also understanding what's happening in the very fast moving world of uh, blockchain technology. I think not many people may have that. They're either, you know, very much into blockchain and perhaps they're not so familiar with, I don't know, financial services regulation, for example, or they're in traditional finance and then they just say, oh, Bitcoin isn't that thing to, for drug lords to launder mm -hmm. money and finance terrorism or something like that. So. I try to kind of bridge the two worlds uh, on one vector, and then I try to bridge uh, academia and practitioners as well. So I think that's where it came from. And to your question, how is it? Well, I, I'm having a very good time <laughs> because basically it's my hobby and my work all in one. And um, so I don't mind working late and spending a lot of time on it. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine there's obviously a lot of synergy. Sometimes when you research things, it will also help you, right, in, in the business world. So sure. yeah, I think it's a very helpful approach just to have an, kind of a de certain degree of neutrality, right, that, that helps making rational decisions and, you know, probably also, probably like, you know, seizing trends a bit earlier than maybe the, the normal players in industry. So let's talk a bit about Lightbulb Capital. So how did you found Lightbulb Capital? Is there a story behind it? And, and kind of what are the services that you guys offer? Yeah, there is, there is a little story. So in 2014, I decided to leave banking. Uh, my last corporate job, I was on the board of HSBC Securities here in Singapore. And um, I had gone back to school part-time to study the topic of innovation. I got really excited about it and thought, okay, there has to be something else, something more interesting than sitting in a, you know, one of those huge banks. And um, it all started out with uh, basically creating a, um, an index product that picked financial, uh, that picked very innovative companies um, according to a metric that suggests that uh, innovation actually impacts the top line. So I thought that was quite interesting. We licensed that. We had, uh, to the New York Stock Exchange actually. And um, then I was well on the way to doing innovative things in finance. Then a few years later, blockchain came about and um, now we really focus on two, two or three things, depending on how you look at it. One is very much education in the field of FinTech and blockchain. So I've got a colleague who's also working with me. We teach a partner with universities but also large financial institutions who want to learn more about these topics. So it's an education business, if you like. And then we also have um, the advisory part of the business where you know, large financial markets businesses come to us and say, okay, we know that you told us three years ago that Bitcoin is not going away, but we now also realize that it's not going away. Where do we start? Where's the liquidity? Who are the players? Uh, you know, how do you even book it? I mean, there's all there's a whole bunch of things that obviously these large organizations need to think through um, to to fit this rather novel beast of cryptocurrencies into their existing frameworks and um, control frameworks and so on. So those are kind of the things that we 
very much focus on. And then, yes, there's my PhD work, which is kind of a little bit more personal. But um, I try to, as you suggested, I try to kind of leverage one for the other. So it's it all ties in together nicely. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's a very good approach. And, and probably you also get this, this question a lot, but um, I was just curious. Where does the name, or how did you come up with the name Lightbulb? Because I know I see that that's a big branding, right? And um, probably like because you guys have innovative ideas, but is there maybe also a story behind it? Or there, there is a story. So I thought I called my company something around innovation, something, something. And I then spoke to a really good friend who is actually brilliant in marketing and branding and all of these things. And and I said, hey, I'm gonna call my company innovation something something and she said yeah no nah, that's not gonna fly because and i will never forget this she said the business card that you have you have to proudly be able to give it to anyone in the world mm. even the president of the united states if you ever get to meet him so put some more thought into how you're going to call your company and not don't call it just innovation something something because that's what you plan to do so then I thought, okay, spend a bit more time. And then, yeah, the, the light bulb came up, obviously, from Edison and, you know, the sparking of ideas and so on. So that's how it, that's how it started. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that sticks, right, with, uh, with the people and, you know, mm. that uh, a good, you know, a recommendation, you know, from your friend. Um, yeah. <laughs> the props that's to her. Um, so, you know, in terms of your papers, right, I know that you've written a paper about, disclosure requirements for ICO. So, mm. and then also this paper, you kind of describe certain requirements that are crucial to increase credibility for this project. So can you kind of give us a, a brief overview or more even an in-depth overview if you want to? I think that's something that will interest a lot of people kind of what are these disclosure requirements? Yeah. So, so maybe I should start with um, the actual problem, right? Mm. Um, so we can learn a little bit from, from traditional markets. And I, I clearly remember in 2017, I think it was, I was able to give a, like a very, very short um, speech at a rather big conference in Taipei in Taiwan. And um, it's very intimidating to me because I never had spoken in, in front of such a big audience, about 2000 people. And basically, the topic that I chose was, you know, let's not screw each other over because in the ICO days, what happened a lot is that everyone felt really great about themselves because they distorted everyone else. But if you think about traditional markets, that didn't really fly, right? So everything that um, the Wolf of Wall Street basically did uh, brought a, a, a wave of regulation upon us that we then had to deal with somehow and less opportunity in markets and so on. So my, my bottom line was, you know, let's just be fair with each other and try to not uh, yeah, engage in any activity that is fraudulent. So, so that's kind of when I started thinking about the whole topic about what could token issuers actually do to contribute to the credibility of markets. And um, basically what we're, what we're saying, and I've, this is a paper that I've written with uh, Nick Krapos, my friend who is based in Shanghai. Um, what we're saying is that there are financial and non-financial um, disclosures that we feel are quite important. Um, this, this paper was actually quite difficult to write because we didn't want to be perceived as the people who say, just copy everything from traditional finance and you know, drop it on this newly developing ecosystem. Because in my mind, that would have stifled innovation a lot. But we wanted to try and um, make a couple of recommendations that will help the market and increase the credibility, but at the same time, not be a massive burden on those token issuers when they go about building their product and, and trying to create their, uh, their systems and and, and yeah, the ecosystems. So we've got um, basic information about the token issuer, because sometimes you don't even know who they are. It's very difficult to get in touch with them. Um, 
I think it's quite interesting to see how some of these projects are incorporated because in my mind, and we also say this in the, in the other paper, um, if you issue an, a utility token, basically you're engaging in some sort of community development kind of activity. So in my mind, it's wrong to use a private limited or a GmbH or an AG for the incorporation. So we prefer to see something like a foundation or something that is, um, you know, where, where, where basically everyone who becomes a member of that organization benefits. Um, I guess the other interesting thing around finance um, really comes from a learning of the bubble implosion that we saw in 2018. And that was that this massively important detail for a token buyer to know a little bit about how much money these projects have in the bank. And I'm, and I'm not, because, you know, many projects basically converted themselves into some sort of crypto hedge fund, because that was suddenly more important than building what they had written down in their white paper. And um, then they started trading and they said, wow, Ethereum's going to go to $5,000 tomorrow. And then we're going to have so much money. Awesome. But it didn't come that way. And it went the other way. So, so what we're saying is, to be fair to token holders, to report on a regular basis how much money you have in the bank would add a lot of credibility. And also, you think about it, right? You have two tokens, they both trade at 10 cents, and you know that one of them has a million dollars in the bank and the other one has 50,000 in the bank. I mean, it's a big, big thing, right? It, it impacts your runway, it impacts which people you can hire. So, so very important detail. Uh, we then also have some non-financial um, uh, disclosures that we recommend. Um, we do want to be able to contact the team because often these products are so new, um, not so easy to use, maybe documentation still needs to be ironed out. So being able to get in touch with somebody makes, makes a big difference. And we also like projects who don't raise a hundred million dollars and then disappear. So projects who give you updates on a regular basis, um, I think also, you know, fare better probably. And but, but that's, we haven't investigated that, but one of the recommendations is you should um, inform your token holders about where you stand, what you're going to do next, and um, also what the issues are, right? Because that gives people a little bit better um, uh, base information as to whether they should engage with you or not. So yeah, so that's basically it. If you if you if that's interesting to you, then um, yeah, the paper is out there as a draft, but we have reworked it, and uh, I'm very happy to share that we we got it accepted in a in a interesting journal. So you'll you'll hear more about that uh, if and if and when the the journal is ready with for the publication. But um, it's accepted, so so we were quite happy with that so then yeah then congrats from my side i mean i've thank written you, the paper you. and uh, i only can recommend everybody to you know read it because especially also for people that are not so familiar with the space it really provides a good overview right to not invest into you know certain projects i'm not going to say any names but um mm. you know it, it's going to really help um you know get a, a good overview you know and like a lot of the aspects that you mentioned are also aspects that i'm personally looking at when I kind of, you know, deep dive into the different projects and especially what you mentioned also about kind of the disclosure and involving the community, informing the community. I think it's crucial, right? When you build like a decentralized or when you market a decentralized project, right? Then I think you should also involve, you know, your community and have a decentralized approach to it, which is sadly something that some projects are lacking, of course. But yeah, mm -hmm. so in terms of obviously no investment advice, but you also mentioned a couple of projects that have been doing well on this regard. So, so maybe can you name one or two examples and what exactly was that they did actually well? So, um, I mean, in the paper, we have uh, a, a couple of small case studies, but, um, and then again, for a lot more detail, you guys can check the paper out, but I, I quite like, the way the Tezos project gives their biannual update as a very 
is, is basically like a, a proper financial report of a big company. Lots of detail. Where did the grant money go? What does the treasury look like? Uh, which projects are they supporting? I mean, if, if, if I'm a Tezos token holder, I feel like they really want to give me an update on what's going on in the ecosystem. I think it's very professional. Um, uh, another project that, you know, has also, interestingly enough, has done exceptionally well over the last few months is, is uh, ThoughtChain. And ThoughtChain has, um, I think, they ended up in our paper because they gave or they give a weekly update on their software development progress and um, wh whether they do that well or whether the product is great or not is a different kind of topic. But this regular update without fail is quite powerful. Uh, I've seen many people send out notes to their community. Oh, this is our weekly update. And it's like, when was the last one, like four months ago? So, so I think, you know, it, if a project can do that, that, that is quite powerful. And it sees that it shows that people are committed and then you can track the progress. Uh, we like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's two, two great examples, you know. So, so thanks for that. And now at this stage, I would like to just um, ask, you know, as we always have a, a weekly question, a being crypto special question, you know. Mm -hmm. So what, what they asked is, how will institutions have to address the digitization and decentralization of finance? And especially since you are coming from that, um, you know, area, what are your experiences currently with this? Yeah. So financial services companies for the longest time always sit in the middle very conveniently, right? They're intermediaries. And, um, you know, why would it be different? Because there's always somebody who wants to borrow money and somebody who has too much and needs to put it somewhere. So why not be the intermediary? It's very logical. It makes a lot of sense uh, for the longest time. Now we're in a different world where, you know, now we have DeFi and we have platforms that basically replicate the services that traditional financial services companies were providing to their customers um, but the operating cost is so much lower. I remember when I was in banking, you know, pretty much any institution is always worried about cost income ratio. How can we lower the cost income ratio, right? But now there's, I mean, I'm not an Ethereum fan, but there's Uniswap, for example, right? Is a market that trades on some days more than Coinbase, who's going to list for a hundred billion dollars in the, uh, on NASDAQ. So you know, everything is basically flipped on its head. Now, to answer the question, if we keep all of that in mind, we, we as financial services community from the old guard, maybe, we have to get used to the idea that we cannot be the center of everything anymore. So I do think that organizations can and will strive that are a little bit more open to the idea that they have to reinvent their business model. Mm. Because if in the future you say, well, but I'm the intermediary and if somebody wants to buy, I'm gonna sell it to them, it's kind of not good enough. So I think th those are my two cents. Obviously it's quite a philosophical question and it, you know I have lots of thoughts on that, but um, yeah, in short, get used to the fact that you're not gonna be the middleman and try to think about other things that you could do. And just to give maybe one or two examples, Banks have a lot of data. Mm. You know, I would highly encourage every bank to think about how to create products on the back of data. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah. No, I think that that was already a, a good overview. And I think if people want to know more, then they can contact you at Lightbulb, right? Sure, <laughs> and then sure. you can sure. um, help them that regard. So, but something you know that I that kind of you know interests me. You mentioned that you're not a fan of Ethereum. And of course, we all know about the scalability issues, the gas fees, and so on. But can you maybe elaborate quickly on? Of course, you don't have to, but um, yeah, sure. Quickly, why you're not a fan of Ethereum? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's okay. To be fair to the Ethereum community, the community is the best in the world. It's the biggest in the world. Um, most ideas 
you know, pop up in Ethereum and that we, everyone has to give them credit for that. I mm -hmm. think that's great. I'm just not so sure whether the way it's architected is so good for finance. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can send you this thing, Nicholas. I, I'm sorry, I haven't done it before our call, but I've written a very short piece about the requirements around finality in finance, for example, with um, uh, another friend of mine, Anish, who is based in London. And you know, the, the way the consensus works in Ethereum, even if it's changing to a proof of stake, is a little bit suboptimal for, uh, from a finality point of view, because there is a probabilistic uh, component to how consensus is established. And what that means is that there is a short or sometimes longer period of time where you kind of don't really know what's going on with your transaction. And in finance, where we move very large amounts around, that is not so great. In fact, there is a documentation from, if I'm not mistaken, from either Bank of International Settlements or IOSCO or one of these entities mm -hmm. that suggests that um, financial markets infrastructure has to have finality um, and that you know the the, the trades can basically um, you know once once they're recognized trades and not only executions which in blockchain case is the same thing um, the the settlement needs to happen in pretty much instantly so so that is one big concern maybe not so relevant outside of finance but in finance uh, rather important uh, the way I see it at the moment. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that's that's a good overview, and I'm I'm looking forward to receiving that paper. <laughs> we'll <laughs> definitely deep dive into it. Um, so now, kind of, you know, as the last part of this interview, going a bit into tokenization, um, just out of the blue, what is like your your favorite tokenization use case? I mean, of course, real estate is a hot market. Just generally tokenizing equity, um, but do maybe do you have any specific use case that you could single out? Yeah, so, I mean, I spent the last 10 months or so working on this paper with my dear co-authors from uh, Rotterdam School of Management. And um, we basically looked at a, a sample that was mostly compromised of, uh, not compromised, com made up of, sorry, I'm missing the word, uh, made up of startup type securities. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the takeaways is that maybe startups don't have to uh, tokenize the equity instantly. Maybe the use case is more interesting for perhaps small and medium sized, more established businesses. Um, I think funds in principle, especially private equity funds are very interesting use case as well. Why? Well, I'd say why not first? <laughs> I think there is a there's this there's this thing where everyone says, well, if we tokenize our equity and then we put it on the market, it's going to be liquid. So we looked into that a little bit when we prepared the paper, and we didn't really find any evidence of that. So even the biggest security token offering at the time, T zero, which is a security token exchange itself, mm -hmm. um, for the time period that we looked at it. Um, I think it traded something like ten thousand dollars per day, so that is not liquid for an offering that you know brought in one hundred thirty-four million or something. So, so let's leave the liquidity piece aside. I think if you think about how difficult it is to transfer ownership today, if you have a private equity investment, it's pretty damn mm. tedious. Yeah, so you know, lots and lots and lots of paperwork. So, so one real benefit that I find is quite tangible is if, and this is why Liechtenstein is actually great because Liechtenstein has a, a, a law that accepts the blockchain record to be the primary record that counts in a, in a court, right? Mm. Um, man, many other countries don't have that. But if you are in a, in a jurisdiction where that's the case and you can um, really accept that the blockchain record is the one that counts, then suddenly transfer of ownership of uh, tokenized fund units, for example, 
is something that uh, can be done very easily, right? As easy as sending Bitcoin or Ether or something from one wallet to the, to the next. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited about the, that transfer of ownership uh, portion. Um, th there might be other interesting use cases where we, we can think about, you know, whether bigger companies can um, finance individual projects by creating a token or a, a security that is represented as a token uh, to, to purely finance a particular uh, portion of their business activity. Um, it's not that this is not possible without blockchain, it actually is, and some people do it, and there's a whole project finance kind of area. But um, th that could be interesting because mm -hmm. there are now also in, there's a new investor group, if you like, um, there are people who made a whole bunch of money in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies who are basically crypto native. And how do you engage them? Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a, maybe that's a way to do it. So those are a few thoughts on, on perhaps tokenization of, of securities. Yeah. I mean, it's great that you mentioned this because we've also discussed like, you know, tokenizing certain compartments of an entity, for instance, um, with, with our partners also at, at Algo Trader. So shout out to them. And where we are, where we are talking kind of, you were kind of in a philosophical state where we talked like, for instance, look at the, the COVID-19 vaccine thing, right? You, you do not want to invest potentially in these big healthcare companies, but you potentially want to invest in that certain department that is developing that vaccine. So I think, you know, potential tokenization in the future could definitely provide a certain benefit on that regard. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's... Great. But funny, funny you mentioned that because in our sample, there is a project like that. Um, I won't mention the name at this minute, but um, it's basically a pharmaceutical company who uh, aimed to raise capital for a particular product that they were going to put forward to FDA for approval. So that, that sort of thing is also happening already, which is quite encouraging. Wow. Okay. That, that's great. Um, so happy to find out more about this in the future. So um, you, you published a paper on October 15th, right? Um, on STOs in general. And, you know, something that struck out was for me also <laughs> the first sentence, security token offerings are not initial coin offerings or a subset of it, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe can you just briefly elaborate how in this paper you distinguish between ICOs and STOs? Yeah. Um... This is a, a, a little disclaimer. Uh, this is a very controversial topic, even amongst uh, scholars. And we have asked many of them for their inputs and we're also very thankful for, for their feedback. Um, we tried to take a, a, you know, a data-based kind of approach to this whole thing. And what we realized is, um, as we said earlier, right, ICOs are basically there to build a community. And um, I think David Jermak, who is a professor at NYU, defined it really nicely with his co-authors when he said that um, ICOs or, or utility tokens are, are basically a consumptive right um, for a product or a service. And that's about it, right? So there's, there's a fundamental difference to what a security is, because a security is basically when you look at look at it from an investor perspective, um, it's something that is bought because you want to have a claim on some sort of cash flow, mm -hmm. and you want, you know, you want to invest, and the, there's a there's a profit objective, um, uh, kind of baked into it, and then from an issuer perspective, it's also quite different because. I'm not an accountant, but I think if you basically sell a utility token before your network is up and running, it's almost like you sell, it, it, it's like um, reward-based crowdfunding, right? You give people the right to use your product before it's built. That's very different from putting a long-term liability like equity on your balance sheet which is what you do when you raise money through a security token. So I think, you know, we, it's kind of interesting, you know, like there's full professor of finance, head of the department, another professor of finance, 
and me, who is maybe not so well uh, decorated in academia yet, but I worked in securities for all my life. And then we're thinking, what is a security? And, you know, then you don't want to be in that kind of situation where you, you have a circular argument, which is also very easy to do, which would be, well, a security is whatever the regulator says is a security. Because that we felt was wrong. Why? Because the US basically had the opinion for the longest time that pretty much every offering is a security. Mm. But then if you apply some of these things that we um, describe in our table one, um, you realize that, that many of the offerings in the US, uh, just to name one, for example, BlockStack was a big securities mm. offering. Uh, we believe is a full on utility token. So mm. you can't really say, oh, it's just what the regulator says it is. Um, what we're trying to do, or when we, when we thought about this, we, we try to say, okay, what's the intent, right? The intent is eventually very, very different uh, between ICO and, and STO. So that's a little bit of a overview uh, mm. uh, about this topic. But yeah, the, the paper has a lot more detail, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, then I can again only say, you know, everybody just read the paper and find more in-depth information on this. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot <laughs> I would obviously like to ask you, but I also want to be, you know, cautious of your time here. So just, um, you know, to, to wrap this up, a question that I always, um, you know, like to ask my guests and, um, you know, you do not have to go into too much detail because I know it's late, but um, where do you see blockchain and tokenization in, in 10 years from now? Wow. That is a big question. Um, well, let's get the easy thing out of the way. Definitely more established. Hmm. Um, when I say more established, everyone, including regulators, will be a lot more comfortable and will understand opportunities and also risks. That I'm pretty sure. Hmm. Because we can already see, you know, there, there are a great deal of regulators who look into blockchain a lot, which is, which is great. Um, what I also think is, you know, now there's this time where there's so much innovation, so many new things coming out every single day. I think that's going to calm down a bit because it, it cannot continue like that forever. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that one, but I'm, I don't think that we can keep up with the current level of innovation um, in 10 years time. Eventually, you know, a lot of issues will have been identified. A lot of use cases have been identified. People will have built on these use cases. Uh, the population uh, will have started to use these systems. And then that is that. So I think that it will be slowing down a little bit. Um, I do think that, and this is kind of my last point to wrap up, I guess. I do think that we have one big issue, which is user experience is mm. kind of a bit weak at the moment. So I would hope that in 10 years time, you know, there are all these systems that people use that are blockchain based but nobody really realizes that they're blockchain based or it just became a standard. Mm. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that we see today around custody and private keys and all of that um, basically has to, has to be baked into the user experience so that it's seamless. I think even uh, two years ago, so I did another interview and a similar question came up and I said, before my mom cannot use it, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm not so bullish on everything, <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, many companies already started working on that. And um, I, I just spoke to a friend today who's trying to build one. And he said, you know, if we get this user experience thing right, mm. uh, it, will, it will really make a difference because now it's rather complicated. And, mm. you know, now, okay, next big thing, NFT is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, Try to bid, if you have no knowledge about blockchain, try to bid for an NFT on one of these platforms. Damn complicated. Mm -hmm. For us, maybe it's quite normal and, you know, we have all the different like MetaMask and whatever mm -hmm. that you need for it. But 
for the normal person who's not interested in blockchain and just likes art or digital art, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, that user experience part is probably the third one that I would mention. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, you know, final statement because I think, you know, that having like an intuitive user interface is going to be the key to, to really acclaim mainstream adoption, right? And I've been hearing this from a lot of, you know, experts in this industry already when I asked this question. And um, so you kind of align with this as well. And that kind of, you know, emphasizes this statement, I would say. And, mm. um, you know, I think that's that's going to be the key, right? So it's not so much always about just having the best technology, but also providing the best experience, as you mentioned correctly, for the user to actually leverage it. And something that I like to always add, um, you know, add here is, and my listeners maybe have heard about it, but like, you know, it's the same with the internet, right? You do not necessarily understand it or when you, or when you ask people on the street, right? Tell me what is the internet, right? They were not going, they're not going to give you a definite answer mostly. So, but they're still using it. And especially, you know, in my generation, which is probably the most internet affectionate um you're mm -hmm. probably the ones that understand it the least right so <laughs> i guess um, it's probably going to be similar with blockchain in the future so yeah then um i mean highly appreciate your great insights it, it was a great interview and it was a pleasure to have you and um yeah we'll, we'll talk soon and have a great day and um yeah i would say sleep well and get some rest right <laughs> okay Thanks, Nicholas, for having me today. And thank you, everyone, for spending time. Uh, for, I know it's Friday afternoon, so just before the weekend. Thank you. Yeah, and um, to everybody listening or watching, as always, thanks for, for joining the podcast. And, you know, um, if you want to know more about what we discussed, I'm sure you can reach out to Dan anytime and also sure. ask him about his papers, which are very interesting. And if you have any other information or guest suggestions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. And, See you next week, guys.